how did Muslim Shiite law approach religious minorities, Jews included? To be sure, in general, the framework of the Dhimma, known from other Muslim political entities, Muslim Sunni political entities in the region before that time and later on, was also applied in Iran uh, under the Shiite law that was enforced from the beginning of the Safavid era on. Meaning the Jews and Christians and other groups are seen as the Mis, meaning protected people. The Dhimma, just to refresh our memory, means protection. It's protection, a protection granted to the people of the book. Those people who are believed to have very received uh, divine revelation, a book through one of God's messengers. In the Jewish context, we are talking about uh, Moses. The people of the book living under Islam merit the Dhimma slash protection. They also merit uh, uh, the protection, specifically they merit, they merit the protection of their, to their lives, property and honor. They also uh, are to receive or are to uh, handle their own communal affairs and communal organizations and institutions. In the Jewish context we are talking about uh, synagogue, uh, the kosher butchery, a mikveh and so on and so forth, the schooling system, the educational system and so on and so forth. All that, the Vima is granted to the people of the book, Jews included, in, as long as they follow a set of stipulations. One of them is the payment of the jizya, this uh, additional tax, and a few other stipulations we mentioned earlier on. This worldview, again, is applied on the Jews in Iran, Shiite Iran, as they are applied on Jews elsewhere in under Islam. There are certain Having said that, there are a few certain unique features applicable to uh, Shiite uh, Islam in the context of Shiite Islam's approach to religious minorities. Number one, there's a concept usually found only in Shiite uh, books of law, which is called Najasat. Najasa in Arabic, Najasa means impurity. Based on a Quranic verse, Shiites would argue that the people of the book are seen as impure. By the way, Sunnis read the same Quranic line and argue that the impurity referred to, uh, refer, attributed to the people of, to the polytheists, people of the book included, is an abstract type of impurity. Shiites, when they read this uh, Quranic line saying that the polytheists are impure and uh, arguing that in this particular context people of the book are included, their impurity in Shiite law is actually not abstract, it's very much palpable, felt, transferable, which means on the ground, if I, a Jew, uh, touch uh, a Shiite, he becomes impure. He's defiled and he needs to go through a process of purification. This law is a very significant law. Your pictures, we have a lot of evidence about it from Safavid times on to the 20th uh, century. Uh, and nowadays there are also some references to uh, uh, this concept of Najasa, impurity in current day uh, Iran. It's not applicable all over, not everybody abides by it anymore. However, for centuries, that was a very significant um, law, obviously with, with uh, uh, repercussions, negative repercussions, ramifications to uh, religious minorities living in a Muslim, in, in a Muslim, within a Muslim majority. If I'm impure, I can't, cannot touch you. I, if I go to buy something in the marketplace, the seller will tell me, don't touch. The seller would put um, whatever I'm looking for in my basket without me touching anything, lest I'll defile the entire merchandise there. Um, there are cases in the 19th century where Jews were not allowed to go out on rainy days or snowy days because water is seen in Islam as well as in Judaism as transferring, uh, transforming pollution. 
As such, certain Shiite ulama in the 19th century declared that in rainy days, snowy days, etc., Jews are not allowed to leave their own houses. This would basically mean segregation and a heavy social pressure on Jews as well as on other religious minorities. This concept is a Shiite concept for the most part. We don't really see that in uh, the Sunni context. Another thing which is uniquely Shiite uh, refers to, or at least is rooted again in a Quranic line, the Quran says that Allah says, Today I allowed you, you Muslims, to consume the food of the people of the book. Sunnis, when they read this line, they read it literally, and indeed they usually have no problem to consume the food of the people of the book. Some, in some cases, I know that they have a problem with Christian food, lest some pork is uh, somehow included in it. But overall, Sunnis have no problem with the people with the people of the book's uh, food. Shiites, nevertheless, when they read this uh, Quranic line, they actually uh, limit its applicability and argue that only certain types of food are allowed in the Quran. And those food types of food are grains and vegetables, uh, raw materials, as long as they did not, they did not come in touch with um, uh, water, which transmits uh, pollution. Uh, there's another thing to be mentioned in this context of food. Uh, Quran calls, uh, or basically prescribes that uh, an animal slaughtered, one slaughtering an animal, one needs to uh, mention God's name on it while slaughtering, in, slaughtering it. As such, Sunnis would have usually no problem to eat uh, Jewish meat because God's name is mentioned on it. There's a bracha said and then a, a certain blessing said and uh, God's name is mentioned on it. Shiites nevertheless would say that even if the butcher is a kitabi, meaning a member of the people of the book, and even if he mentions God's name upon doing that, the food, this meat is not to be uh, consumed by uh, Shiites. The same Quranic line, I'm moving on, same Quranic line says, today I, Allah, allowed you to eat the food uh, produced by the food of the people of the and I also allow you to marry their chaste women. This is more or less the Quranic line. There are a few other details uh, in it. And the Sunnis read this line. Again, they read it literally more or less. And as such, Sunnis, Sunni men, are marrying sometimes women of the people of uh, the book. Not necessarily while asking them or forcing them to convert to uh, Islam. Shiites, when they read this Quranic line, again, they limit its applicability and they argue that there are at least two major types of marriage. One is a marriage which is potentially, hopefully, eternal. When a person approaches a lady or vice versa and they decide to marry each other forever. This type of marriage is not mentioned in this Quranic line, they would argue, Shiites would argue. This Quranic line refers to another inferior uh, type of marriage, inferior to the previous potentially eternal one. And this second type of marriage is known as muta'a. Muta'a means pleasure. This marriage is translated as either, as either marriage of pleasure or temporary marriage. Muta'a means that a person approaches, uh, or, 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 I'll put it differently, Men and a, a man and a woman decide to marry each other, but they do that for a limited time period from three days to 99 years, and they fix it, actually decide on it in advance. At the end of the exact period uh, fixed in advance, the, the, these marriages are null, null and void. This type of marriage is seen as inferior to the previous one, when Shiites read the Quranic line, we just mentioned that a Muslim men can marry a woman, a woman from the people of the book, they argue that, usually they argue, not all of them, but usually they would argue that what is referred to in this context is not the 
marriage of the higher status, the ones which are potentially forever eternal types of marriage, type of marriage, but it refers to the uh, inferior type of marriage, to the muta type of marriage. There are a few other differences between the Sunni more lenient approach and the Shiite more strict, harsh, more harsher approach to uh, religious minorities. These three elements, that is impurity, food, and in the case of marriage, women uh, should be born in, uh, born in mind. We have certain texts written in Safavid times by some members of the ulama, uh, and one of them is a very significant person whose name is Majlisi. He is known as actually Majlisi II, who passed away in 1699, or at the very beginning of the 18th century. One of the, he was a prolific writer to begin with, uh, nominated to uh, the uh, to the, the uh, appointment to, to the position of Shaykh al-Islam, the head of the religious hierarchy in uh, Safavid uh, times. He was very much uh, propagating uh, the Shiite uh, Shiite Islam, 12 of Shiite Islam, the Imamiya. He was fighting whatever he saw, or whatever he defined as uh, heresies. Uh, he wrote uh, popular texts in Persian about Shiite topics, thereby practically um, familiarizing society with Shiite Islam. One of his tractates, a short one, uh, discusses religious uh, minorities uh, and actually speaks about the status of religious minorities <laughs> in uh, the, 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 the ideal relationships between the Muslim government and religious minorities. And in this text, he uh, puts down the laws of the Vima, which are more or less similar to those laws found in the, the Sunni context. Towards the end of this treatise, a treatise known as the, the treatise uh, of uh, the lighting bolts against the Jews, he mentions also the concepts of uh, impurity. Mm -hmm.